Hey, Hi. Ellen. How How's are you? Going? I'm well. How are you? That's so too. good. I love this Owen neon sign. Oh, thank you. This yeah. is incredible. Did you get that custom made? I did, yeah. I it's so one. nice. It's so good. Glow Hub. Uh, I don't know if I'm allowed to plug a business, but... <laughs> plug it. Plug it. <laughs> it's, like, it's like, it's Glow Hub <laughs> on Instagram. <laughs> Maybe I should, I feel like I need one right here. There's like this big empty space. Yeah. So, yeah. Just Sarah. I feel like it really brightens up the space. And I think that there's nothing that makes you feel more like that bitch than having like a neon <laughs> sign with your name. With your name. In it. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> you should just get girl on girl, Sarah, on your yes. on, I think that would be so on the cool. back. Yeah. Okay. You know what? It's happening. That's what I want yeah. for Christmas, Persis. If you're wondering, that's what I want. Done. Perfect. <laughs> um, thank you so much for chatting with us. Of we course. Thank you for are having me. So excited. I've for been pumped. a fan of yours. Like I'm a fan. So oh, I no. <laughs> yeah, I discovered your Instagram like I wanna say maybe five months ago six months ago, something like that. And you know when you discover an account and you don't even know why, but like there's just something, you love everything they do. Like everything you were posting, I was like, I, I love this. I'm, I'm on top of this. Like he's got a new post, he's got a new story. And I'm not <laughs> usually like that. Like I'm not on my social media that much, but yeah. there was just something about you that I just like loved just like how you showed up. Like it was so authentic. It was so fun. And just the fact, like, obviously, we are a queer podcast. We talk about queerness every single week of our lives. And so I've just been engaging with a lot more of that content, too. But I'm, like, mm -hmm. a genuine fan. Oh, my God. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, hello. I'm like, what? No, it's Moi? always, like, so heartwarming just to hear that, like, me being myself is being received well. Like, I love that. Yeah. Yeah, Thank because you, you can much. tell you're just showing up as you. I think I think that's what I respond to. And just yeah. your story was so fascinating. Like it's just one of those things that was like purse, we have to see if Owen would ever chat with us. Cause like yeah. they're just they're just so great. And she was like, I'm on it. <laughs> that's the first thing I noticed about you was your authenticity. Like yeah. Sarah was just sending me videos and I was like, yes. Cause I think that's what people resonate with, right? Like there's so many people who can just be posting content, but what I found with you is that I was just genuinely interested in wanting to know more. And you're just mm -hmm. showing up as yourself and like that's the best thing you can do. A hundred percent. And you know what? Like I, I've been on social media for a while, but I didn't start like, I wouldn't say I've ever like, uh, I, like quote unquote blowing up. Like I didn't start getting like the response that I have now until about like five or six months ago and that was when I actually started expressing myself authentically on social media. Up until then I was always putting forward this like highly sexually charged image um, yeah. because I lived a lot of my life on like performing for men and appearing desirable to people and I for so many years I was like why? Am I not getting all the followers that I see other people getting? Like, why am I not? Why is nobody responding to this? Like, why, 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 why? Yeah. And I realized once I actually started making content from the heart is because A, I was never supposed to be recognized for those things that I was trying before. I meant to be recognized mm -hmm. for other things. And yeah, people resonate with authenticity. And when I started, speaking and creating from the heart is when I got a response. Like, so you yeah. kind of, yeah. like, this is what people want to hear from me and this is what I'm here to deliver. Because exactly people struggle that. to find their purpose. And in social media, especially, it's such a big competitive, like, space. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think that first and foremost, it's my purpose. And the positive response has just been a secondary amazing thing. Yeah, absolutely. And it just seems so obvious. Like, of course, when you show up as yourself, people are going to resonate. But yeah. if you find out what that means, like, it's kind of like, takes a while to figure out what exactly that means. Yeah. I mean, it, it took me like 27 years. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. ah! Okay, well, why don't you tell everyone a little bit about yourself? How do you identify? What are your pronouns? Where do you live? What do you do? Okay. 
Hello, everyone. <laughs> uh, my name is Owen Anra. I am an Indigenous two-spirit model, dancer, and social media content creator. I, I identify as, as male, two-spirit, um, and my pronouns are he, him, his, and sometimes they. I am comfortable, comfortable with either. And I, that's me. <laughs> <laughs> we always joke about too when someone asks you like, okay, tell us about yourself. It's always like, okay, like here are the basics and then yeah. <laughs> now what? Yeah. You have to have like a pitch ready. <laughs> yeah. But you're a Canadian. You live in Vancouver. Oh, yes. Also, yeah. Um, it's so funny because being an Indigenous, like I personally have a complicated relationship with like identifying as Canadian. Yeah. And that's only been a recent thing. Like had you asked me for the first 26 years of my life, are you Canadian? I would have been like, yes, absolutely Canadian. But now just reconnecting with my indigenous culture and understanding that we have been here long, long before Canada ever existed. And it's like, how can I identify as Canadian, especially when I know exactly what Canada was built on and that is literally the backs and bodies of my people. Yeah. yeah. Like, how can I? But yeah, I am Canadian. I have a Canadian passport. Like, For sure, for um, sure. And yeah, so I live um, on the unceded ancestral territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil nations. And that is also known as Vancouver, British Columbia. Tell us a bit about your growing up experience. OK, so. Uh, I... <laughs> I was gonna be like, I would, but I haven't grown up yet. <laughs> no. I love that. Relatable. Um, <laughs> so I was, I am indigenous. I was born to an indigenous family and I was put up for adoption very, very young. And I was raised in a very Christian family uh, in a very small rural farm town. Um, oh, wow. And that meant that I was never comfortable expressing my who I was. I was, I meant I had to suppress a lot of things, um, particularly my sexuality and just everything. Honestly, I was like the blackest black sheep of the entire family. And it wasn't even just my household family, like we all lived in close vicinity to my cousins and everything. And it was like the whole family, everybody like went to church every Sunday. There was like Bible study at my uncle's house. There was like youth group at the other one's house. And they all like fit together. They were like, they all just did the same thing. And I was like really the only one that like didn't fit in at all and mm -hmm. didn't get along with almost any of them. Wow. And so that was like the growing up life and then school also um, being like, it's a small town. There was population like 5,000. I think I was the only that I knew of gay kid in my high school. And it was difficult a lot because I didn't, I not only didn't feel safe to express who I was at home, I didn't feel safe to express who I was at school. And I really didn't have any space where I could explore who I was. And as a result of that, I picked up drugs and alcohol to cope with that mm -hmm. and to feel like I could fit in for once to be, to party with the cool kids. And like, finally, right. they're going to look at me as one of their own. And right. And I just got so addicted to that feeling of like, feeling like I fit in for once that I was just, I was constantly drinking and doing cocaine and that progressed into uh, an addiction. And in a couple of years I moved to Vancouver and it went from like the addiction just, I mean, you know when they say that you can't like you can't like run away from your problems. Like it'll always like find you. Mm -hmm. That was, it was like very that. And not that I was like running away, but I definitely brought them with me because the problem was in here. Right. And yeah, so it, it grew into an even 
bigger addiction or more rampant until I was living on the street in Vancouver and I was shooting at meth and I was like, um, I was an escort for a lot of years and I just was very, very lost in, in relation to where I thought my life was going. Right. Or where I wanted it to go. I was, mm -hmm. if I wanted to, if I wanted my life going right, I was going left. Mm. And it was like that for a lot, a lot of years until recently. I'm wow. curious to know about the moment you realized you were a little different from the people you were surrounded with when you were growing up. Um, <clears throat> I, okay, well, I knew that I was different by the color of my skin. Um, I knew that I was adopted. I knew that, um, like myself and my brother, we were both adopted into the same family. Um, and so we were both very much the odd ones out, but he fit in a lot better than I did. So I knew by the way that I looked, I knew that I was different, but then later on, when it became apparent that I was different because of not only what I looked like on the outside, but also like who I was on the inside. It was, I think it's like the most embarrassing story. I don't think I've ever told anybody this, but I remember I, one of my chores uh, growing up was to fold the family's laundry and put it away. And so I had like folded my mom and my dad's laundry and like put it away. I, think I did my brother's and mine and then I was in my sister's room I was like folding her laundry and I was putting it away and then like I just started trying on her underwear Aww, <laughs> yes. and I'm like I'm in front of the me in her room and I I don't know why like I didn't have to I didn't have to take off my clothes in order to do it but I was just like, like in order to get like the full affect the full feel my woman fantasy like at whatever fucking age I was so yeah. young yeah. sorry yeah. for swearing no oh, you can swear like, on this podcast okay <laughs> so I'm like I, I I can't even guess like I'm young I would say I don't know I, I, I don't even remember yeah so I'm I'm yeah trying on her lingerie and I'm like dancing around basically naked in her room and she comes in to my room and she's like, obviously, like, what the fuck is going on here? <laughs> and she like, like screams for my mom, and that was the first time that I remember oh. being a little different. Like right. maybe not everybody did that. <laughs> when you were, yeah. would do you remember? You were so young, and but do you remember like when you were doing it? Were you like, this is wrong, or were you just like, I feel like I want to do this and I'm gonna do it? Oh my god, I was and then, feeling my oats. Uh, <laughs> like, yes, yes, yes. Like maybe I felt, maybe I felt extra scandalous, and maybe it wasn't just like the black lace that was making me making me feel scandalous. Maybe it was because. I probably knew that it was like wrong and I you say wrong in quotations because like totally. it isn't but yeah. the belief system that I was that has been instilled in me growing up in a religious family like that's wrong you don't totally. do that shit right yeah right and then obviously the reaction from not only your sister but then your mom then my mom yeah <gasps> and I was like that was just further information for me that like oh mm -mm. wow well, you're like crazy. but I'm feeling myself that. yeah, yeah. <laughs> so okay so you you realized something was a little bit different and can I ask why you ended up moving to Vancouver I moved to Vancouver originally to pursue modeling and dancing and just a career of I don't know you know having my name in lights like that sort of thing yes. <laughs> you're really manifesting it like that's, that's I really I know what I just had to make it happen my goddamn self when you got to Vancouver and you were starting to like acclimatize to this area to a city to a place mm -hmm. where there is a gay community did you feel like okay I've got a little bit of like a safer space here when I got here it was like I felt comfortable in a city. It felt like it was right for me. There wasn't really much of a culture shock. I was like, this is where I'm supposed to be. Mm -hmm. um, and then it really just became time for me to start exploring. And I was like, okay, now we can start the rest of my life that I've been putting on hold for the past forever. 
Yeah. So like, let's get into it. <laughs> Download Grinder. Yeah. And I got into it. Like, I wasted no goddamn time. <laughs> and, <laughs> unfortunately, well, I don't know that it's unfortunate because the path has led me here and I'm okay with where I am today, but the situation was that I think one of almost one of the first people that I met on Grinder, it turned into like they were doing drugs and I was and it be, it was like a sex party thing and it turned into me trying all these new drugs for the first time ever because I like yeah. I knew cocaine really well I was yeah. super good at cocaine I was the best at it yeah and then A plus <laughs> I was so bad. <laughs> and then all of a sudden I get into this this city gay community where there wasn't a lot of cocaine in the circles that I was meeting. Um, it was expensive. It was more expensive and it was harder to find. And instead of that, they had something called tea, also known mm -hmm. as Tina, which is crystal meth or speed. Mm -hmm. And that is a very like highly used sex drug in the gay community, um, as well as G, GHB, which is like, kind of like date rape, um, but you, you like take it yourself is the general yeah. thing. Mm -hmm. And then, yeah, and then I tried like MDMA and I tried ketamine and I just, it was like, Anyways, yeah, one of the first times, one of the first experiences that I had on Grinder in the city was a big smorgasbord of all of those things. And it was so much fun for me. I was like, I have never experienced anything like this. This is like everything that I could have ever dreamed of. Mm -hmm. And why would I ever want to do anything other than this? This is so totally. much fun. Totally. Yeah. And it just, it carried me away. Yeah, it's especially infectious. from like, yep, and also coming from your background too of just like being around such a conservative environment, like, mm -hmm. it's just so different. Yeah. Did you have a coming out experience? Like, did you come out to your um, adopted family or anything like that? They knew that I was gay, and mm. I knew that they knew, and they knew that I knew that they knew, and it was <laughs> like everybody was in the know, but yeah. we just didn't talk about it, right. and it. that. That was kind of a theme with a lot of things in our family. We just, we didn't really talk. We didn't really connect that much. Yeah. I didn't feel like, yeah, we just didn't really talk about a lot of things. So I didn't have an official coming out moment. <laughs> right. Where I, I mean, there were times when like my mom like caught me watching gay porn on the family computer but like mm -hmm. still like i didn't i didn't admit to it and there were times when they would ask but i wouldn't admit to it because i knew what they thought of it and mm -hmm. i remember there was one time when my dad gave me this little pamphlet that he got from the church and it all in it was all about how being gay is wrong and oh i had gosh. never like i hadn't i hadn't said anything to him but i mean like he knew and yeah. just reading that pamphlet was further information to me that I was not safe to be who I was around these people. And I mean, I love them so much and we have come a long way since then. So it's hard for me to say like these people, but like mm -hmm. at that time, that is exactly what I felt. I was like, I need to keep myself safe at all costs around these people who cannot accept me and cannot love me the way that I need. And so I will hide this for as long as I need. I'm so Absolutely. sorry. You know, like. I mean, it built me. I had a choice. I could be strong. I could be the person that I am right now, or I could continue to numb with all of my, my numbing agents, my drugs, and my sex, and my alcohol, and my avoidance, yeah. and my refusal to take accountability and my refusal to believe in myself enough to put in the work yeah. i could do all of that and that's easy that would be the easy thing but being strong is a choice and it's a choice that everyone can make i believe yeah i agree with that did you also find that like your art was also an outlet for you in a way like getting into dance and into modeling and everything like that? 
during these times? An outlet maybe is a good word for it. I just remember like that, yeah. So when I was growing up in my town and I had started dancing, um, that was definitely an outlet for me. And that was kind of a vessel for my dream, I mm -hmm. think. Just having that talent and that thing that I could do, it was like, okay, this is this is something that can carry me to my dreams of like being big. I don't know yeah. what big meant, but I just I know I wanted to be big. Yeah. And sure. so that that seemed like at the time what was gonna get me to be big. And then later it was modeling that that seemed at the time to be what was gonna make me big. And it wasn't until recovering from, it wasn't until being deep in addiction and realizing that the only thing, that the true thing that would make me big was recovering from this addiction and sharing my story and helping other people through it. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah. And that's exactly what happened. Like you said, six months ago, when you started really showing up authentically, mm -hmm. that was when you blew, like you're, you blew up, I mean, air quotes, but like you, you really, your reach just like skyrocketed. Yeah, yeah honestly, I remember the day. <laughs> <laughs> I am, um, because I have, I have been feeling like I, was just in a transition period and I felt like I have all the tools. I'm I'm on my way. I know that I'm going in the right direction. And I just kind of like opened it up to the universe and to my guides, and my ancestors. And I just, I went down to the water in English Bay and mm -hmm. I had a moment, a few moments there and I just meditated and I just said, hey, I'm ready. I'm ready for whatever I'm supposed to be doing. Guide me, use me. I'm Now's the time, I'm ready. And then I finished that little meditation and I looked at my phone and the two TikToks that I had just posted like half an hour before had like massively skyrocketed and were just like going viral. <laughs> That and timing, ever, too. ever wow. since then, it has just been a steady incline. That's incredible. Shut up. I'm not kidding. That's incredible. Yeah. That is crazy. You cannot make that shit up. No. no. Your ancestors, they were like, listen, you ask and yeah. you receive, you know? Yeah, yes, they're like, it's actually you are true. ready. You are ready. <laughs> yeah. We were just waiting for you to say it. You're yes. ready. Yeah. Oh my God. That's the best story I've ever heard. <laughs> yes. Ah! And, and and you know what? And I that's why I do believe in that so much, right? Like people yeah. often like don't or they'll just, it's like the energy you also put out is what you will receive. Um, and I also find myself sometimes just being like, not, not having like false positivity. I think we need to stay authentic. Like we've mentioned a few times, but yeah, just, just ask for those things, say what you want and almost say it as if it's in like the present. But I think mm -hmm. ready is the most important thing. Like, are you ready? Yeah, I think that's the most important thing because sometimes we ask for things that aren't necessarily for us. Yeah. And as much as we want them to be for us, they just aren't for us. And so when we ask for it, and then we don't get it, we're like, ugh, like this doesn't work. But right. I think that the most important thing is to be, like I don't necessarily know what is what is mine, but I, I need the universe and the powers that be to know that I'm ready for whatever it is. And so when I say that I'm open and ready to receive what is mine, that's when it comes to me. Speaking of your ancestors, can we dive into your indigenous roots a little bit? Because yes. you, one of the videos I remember that I was like, okay, I'm in love with this account. That was when you reconnected with your birth family. Yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about it? You probably told the story a bunch in the last few months. Um, yeah, I would love to. It was really special. Um, so when I was growing up, I felt like I got everything that I needed out of having a family. I didn't feel like I was missing a family because I was, and this is in part because I was adopted very young. And so I didn't know any other family than the one that I had. 
Um, it was a little different for my brother. He was older than me, excuse me. He was older than me. And he has a memory of our mother. And he, he had a family that he was taken away from. And wow. so like for him growing up, he kind of always felt like um, that there had maybe been a part missing. Whereas I didn't feel that because this family was the only family that I ever knew. Nice. And so I never wanted to reach out to them because um, I didn't want my family to feel like I was replacing them. And also because I was very ashamed to be Indigenous, I just had no interest in reaching out because um, the environment that I grew up in, in the town that I grew up in, and seeing how Indigenous people were treated in my town and talked about, and how they were depicted in old Western movies and how just everything, everything I knew about indigenous people was not good. And I did not want to be associated with it. And so I was like, not only do I not need a new family, I don't want to be associated with being native, like absolutely not. Mm -hmm. So I didn't reach out for the longest time. And it wasn't until moving to Vancouver I remember having a conversation with one of my friends and he was telling me how he just like loves Native American stories so much and he's like watched, watched documentaries about it and he just respects it so much and he's like if I was Native I would be so so proud and that was the first moment that I remember having my belief system shifted to something other than negative. I was like, that was the first moment where I was like, oh my God, maybe, oh my God, maybe he's right. Like maybe this is something I should be proud of. Yeah. And so I, and that just grew more and more, especially seeing indigenous people on social media, mm -hmm. um, just being proud, practicing their culture, being proud, being unapologetic and just showing up authentically indigenous without this narrative, this like, uh, like white colonist narrative film over yeah. like yeah I could finally see indigenous people as they were presenting themselves without um, it being covered by like a colonist lens you know what I mean mm -hmm. oh yeah and so I was like oh my god finally something to be proud of um, yes. and then yeah and then I think in December, my brother reached out to my birth family and then they reached out to me and I hesitated for a little bit because I, w I, just, I still wasn't sure um, because I still, I just, after so many years of being not close with my family, um, I have finally started to get close to them again because I'm finally learning how to like talk about my feelings and like connect with people and I'm like now I'm gonna I'm gonna finally talk about my feelings and connect with my family so now we finally have this relationship that I feel good about and I don't yet know if I want to go looking for another family you know right right but I did because they were all reaching out to me and I was like I think this is just the next step in my journey I think in order for me to be the person that I need to be, to be the person that I'm meant to be, I need to be deeply rooted and connected in where I actually come from. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so then I met my family in uh, a couple months ago, a few months ago, and yeah. it was just beautiful. and. There were a lot of people that were like, oh, it must have been so emotional and like, I hope you got closure. Mm -hmm. Okay, it wasn't like, it wasn't overwhelmingly emotional. I wouldn't, yeah. I'm not, I'm not going to say it wasn't emotional because I had emotions. And those sure. emotions were gratitude and fulfillment and like those kind of feelings. But I wasn't, it wasn't like a tumultuous emotional roller coaster. Yeah. I was meeting these people for the first time, it felt like, and mm -hmm. I was just showing up as I was and that was enough. I fit in with them and they welcomed me with open arms and it was just, everything was like good. And I mm -hmm. didn't get any closure because 
I think that in order to have closure, it needs to be like an open wound type situation and it never was for me. So it was more of like an open door. Like it wasn't closure, it was open -er, you know? <laughs> And just that like, connection, hey. like you can just, you're open to it, you see them and you just know it's, it's there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's there.